I'm Alicia Bay Laurel. Welcome to Creative Current. Tonight we're going to enjoy the music of Joe Gallivan and Tom McNally, who are sitting here beside me. This is Joe Gallivan and Tom McNally. And we're going to talk first a little bit about improvised music. Tell me a little bit about totally improvised music. Improvised music's been with us since the beginning of time. People have started playing, making instruments and playing instruments. Print music is only uh, maybe 5% of the world's music. The rest of it is either passed on by rote or it's improvised. But it's very rarely heard now. Uh, well, this is not our fault. <laughs> 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 but you can't blame that one on us. We're, we're trying very hard to bring people to, to appreciate the musicians being in the moment, creating music in the moment. I think the other thing is that when you're, when you're dealing with written music or notated music of any kind, you know, already you have something to build off of that's been given to you already. You know? Whereas you know, when you're completely improvising, what you have to build off of is you know, your own training and your own practice in the, in the music itself. Um, which may be one reason why, you know, especially in, in an age of documentation, you know, it's, it's not quite as common. Um, I mean, it's still, there's still plenty of people out there doing it and making incredible music, but um, yeah, the, I mean, the music is very much about one's own, one's own process. So Tom, tell me how you came into this music. What is your lineage musically? Oh man, well, um, I mean, basically, uh, when I was uh, when I was about 17, 18 years old, um, I was living in Portland, Oregon, and I wound up, um, I was playing with a drummer named Dave Storrs, a great drummer who's in Corvallis, and he introduced me to Rob Blakesley, who's uh, an absolutely amazing trumpet player who lives in Portland. And, um, you know, I met Rob and basically started studying with him and playing with him, and um, that was kind of the, the addiction right there because Rob, uh, Rob is just an absolutely incredible improviser. You know, uh, he's a great composer as well, but um, you know, as an improviser, he's just you know, peerless. <laughs> and and so that was that was really um, that was really my first hand entry, you know, my first hand experience entry into improvising music and the the power that it held as an audience member. You know, I, certainly when uh, you know, when I first got to know Rob, I wasn't, you know, knowledgeable about this kind of music and all that sort of thing. But the music was just so profound and so beautiful that it just kind of caught me. Um, and then through Rob, I met a number of other people, both in Portland and you know throughout the country. Uh, you know, n notably in Portland, John Gross and Michael Vladkovich, uh, who also wound up being, um, you know, teachers, mentors, and uh, cohorts. So and, that and you went to New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, good old East Coast. Um, yeah, I was invited to to go out to New York by Ornette Coleman, um, and we played together for a little while. And uh, I was supposed to go on tour with him, but it didn't work out because it was a little too last minute to get a visa into China. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was New York for me. All right. Not a bad entrance into the city. Not at all. Not at all. How about you, Joe? How did you f uh, find your way into this music? Uh, yeah, 12 hours, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, no, I, I started playing early. I was a professional. Tom did too. He didn't say that. He started playing professionally at an early age. He was playing at 15, and so, as uh, I was as well. I also uh, played piano since I was you know, old enough to hit a key. Well, you can't play our piano. No. Uh, <laughs> no he, what was it? Uh, I started playing early, and uh, I was attracted to jazz. And uh, my life was became jazz. And then one day I, I realized I didn't know enough music, and so I, I studied everything I could, uh, composition, conducting, arranging, everything. So I started on a path of learning music. and. Uh, the real outlet, then I saw the outlet of this music was, was improvisation, but free improvisation, not jazz. Jazz was just part of it. It's important 
to know that it's not the only music and they're kind of, it's not the only improvised music in the world. And uh, so I sought out the players who played this music and, and work with them. And I, I was very lucky to get almost every job that I ever wanted, like uh, where I learned things. Like uh, I worked, I worked with uh, the great organ player Larry Young. We had the original Love Call on, and um, I was strictly I was I went in the club to see him play, and he came off the bandstand and gave me a job from just hearing some things that I did, and uh, then I I was uh, I was playing at uh, Newport with Elvin John to see uh, Gretch Grace and. Uh, Gil Evans hired me, and that was good, and that reinforced a lot of my studying with him because he gave me his scores, and and not that I, I want to do anything like he does, but I realized that he had studied a lot of the same things that I did, and uh, you know, like uh, Mr. Ketty's book, 20th Century Harmony, in our conversation. So I was in his band for three years, you know. I, you know, in Europe, I played with everybody, Evan Parker and Kenny Wheeler and all those people. I played with all the people I aspired to play with, and that was, that was great. And of course, I had a long-term relationship with the saxophone player from Miami called Charles Austin. We played together for over 20 years, and uh, we made a lot of records, and uh, I, you know, I'm, if you play this music, you have to be a student forever. You're always the student. You never, you're never the man. You're never the guru. You're the student. Once you become, stop being a student, you're finished. Once you stop learning, it's over. You know, like I always get up here every day thinking, I don't know enough. I got to learn something today, and that's how, that's how you work. And I know he works the same way because you can tell his playing is different from day to day, week to week. You know, you know, it's, it's really, it's very important. It's a, and that. Charles Austin was the same. Very few players are like that, who really understand that they are forever the student. Yeah, I, I just dovetail on that. Uh, John Gross always loves to say, uh, you can never get it right, but you can always get better. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember when I moved to LA, um, the first time I went back to Portland was probably about two years after being down here. And you know, John was kind of the, the high watermark of musicianship. You know, there's a, there's a sort of handful of guys in my own personal experience that, you know, kind of hit that level of, of, of power of beauty, you know, in their playing, like every time they play. And I remember going back to Portland and hearing him play, and I just couldn't believe that he had gotten better. You know what I mean? Like, like my whole idea of what great could be had just been expanded. You know what I mean? Um, that's, that's another thing that's so great about this music. You, you see the people who've been doing it, who are who are masters at it, and they'll just blow your mind every time because they're always working at it. Tell me a little bit about the original Love Cry Want and your new Love Cry Want. Well, <laughs> the original Love Cry Want was uh, Larry Young and a guitar player from D.C. called Nicholas and myself. His name was really Steve Nicholas, but it, everyone called him Nicholas, and he was. Uh, Great guitar player, so so criminal. <laughs> and, uh, Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was. He, I don't know whether he wanted to be, be West Montgomery, or Al Capone. I could never figure out which which one he wanted to be. You know, like uh, you know, Lucky Luciano was his hero. You know, uh, but he was a great guitar player, and uh, we did spectacular gigs, and. We were considered untouchables because we were just too, too radical for what was going on. You know, Larry left Lifetime, and that was the watermark for many people. But we were actually, we went, we pushed the envelope more, and, uh, and sometimes we would hire other people, like on our, on our album, our only album. We had another drum and percussion player, Junior Molinari, who was a great player who was mistakenly thrown off the roof of a building in the Bronx by the police. Mistakenly. 
they, they thought he was a drug dealer and they threw him off the roof of the building in New York. I mean, in fact, that whole band, I'm the only one alive because they all, they all succumbed to drugs, that whole band. Drugs killed them all. And uh, I see, I'm a, I'm a little bit anti. You know. yeah, fast forward to the newer sober or love cry one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's almost like in the, to get in love cry well, you have to pass a drug test, you know, because I can't, I can't handle it. I don't want to lose my friends, you know. And I don't, you know, people I play with, and, you know, just, just when we're getting gigs, people start dying. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we did, so we, we, we hung on for some years, and what happened is basically management split us up. They became divisive, and... Um, so we carried around, Nicholas actually carried around the uh, Love Cry album in a plastic bag for 19 years. So I finally said, give me this tape, and I put it out. And uh, we've had good success with it. It was uh, it got uh, one of the 35 least something album of, of the last 35 years in uh, Jazz Times, and we got it one of the Wire Records of the Year and the Wire magazine in London, and various things, or, or some Morgan magazine for top seven records of the year or something, I don't know. It was a very successful band. It was a very good band, and it's a shame that people didn't really get to hear only, there's only like 40 minutes of this band uh, recorded, and that band was really happening, it was happening. And we're, we're gonna try not to let it happen with this love cry one, so we actually get stuff done and things recorded, and, and we actually tour and do those things that we should be doing. Our debut album's already more than 40 minutes long. <laughs> well, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and Tom brought into the fold someone I didn't know, but who's very good, brought in Michelle Webb. And you could tell him, you could talk about you and her. Oh man, well, I've already talked about I, I met Michelle shortly after I moved to Los Angeles. She was coming through town on tour, and um, we did a gig together, and she's just incredible. She's just really unbelievable. Um, you know, she, she's a guitarist slash bassist. I always say, you know, she, she covers a lot of sonic territory, but she's not really a guitarist or a bassist, um, but she plays in those registers, you know. Um, but she's just... She's just amazing, you know, tremendously, tremendously beautiful, powerful player. Um, and person. And, yeah, and person, a, a wonderful person as well. Um, yeah, she came through town and, um, you know, we became friends right away, you know, and uh, and then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, you know, we'd done a handful of other little gigs here and there. And um, then, you know, when I met Joe and Joe was saying, well, you know, we need a, a third person. Um, it just occurred to me that Michelle was the perfect person. You know, she she had the the combination of a very strong and personal melodic sense. You know, I mean, her musicianship is top notch, uh, of course. And uh, but yeah, the the strong personal melodic sense, and then also she has the the whole like noise sonics, you know, textural thing like totally together. Um, you know, and and she's just she's just amazing. You know, she's a joy to work with uh, on stage and off. And so yeah, we we brought her in and did the album and yeah, she's wonderful. So she's, she's a she's a good friend of mine, good old friend of mine. She's waiting to go to work. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna wrap up the interview now and uh, take a very tiny break, and then you guys are gonna play all the way to the end of our show. Sounds good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 